Hi there. Please wear your headphones to hear this immersive sound podcast. We're in Ghazni, somewhere in southeastern Afghanistan, roughly 250 years ago. These lands are dangerous for a Hindu holy man, a fakir like Purnapuri. He's on a pilgrimage. What a strange man he is. He's holding his arms over his head as a penance. No, really. He's traveling across Asia, his hands clasping opposite elbows and forming an upside down U over his head. Purnapuri peers into the distance and sees an army and hears the thunder of 30,000 men marching. Out of it emerges a king on a black stallion who spurs on his horse and rides towards Purnapuri. From whence, Fakir, are you come? The king says. Okay, we have to break in here. From whence, Fakir, are you come? I know what you're thinking. Who talks like that, right? Well, this is from Purnpuri's original account that we found in a European magazine. It was published back in 1810. Okay, let's get back to the story. From whence, Fakir, are you come? The king says. I came from Hindustan and I'm going to visit the great Jwala. Purnapuri replies, The king is Ahmad Shah Turani, the founder of Afghanistan. He is known for owning a diamond large as a small hen's egg that is set in a bazuband or armband. The diamond is known as the Kohi Noor, the mountain of light. And the other thing to know about King Ahmad is that he has a large ulcer on his face that's eating away his nose and brain. He usually covers it up with a fake nose made of silver and precious gems. King Ahmad rides away and that evening he sends his men to fetch Poon Puri to his camp. Puri waits at a respectful distance until the king addresses him. Akir, you are a native of India. Do you know any remedy for this disease? <laughs> I am not acquainted with any remedy that can cure that which has been granted by God. Recollect, O king, that ever since thou hadst this ulcer, thou hast been seated on the throne, Unpuri replies. Dangerous words. But King Ahmad remains calm. He orders royal elephants to take Fakir onward on his journey. Soon, maggots infest King Ahmad's face. They drop into his mouth when he eats or drinks. He dies within years. And the Kohinoor passes on to his son. Some might say, having claimed its latest victim. This is episode two, The Jewels of the Maharajas on Scrolls and Leaves, a world history podcast featuring stories from the margins. I'm Gayathri Vaidyanathan. And I'm Mary Rose Abraham. We're in season one, Trade Winds, a series that explores how trade across the Indian Ocean transformed us. Stay tuned for a wild story about a single jewel that changes hands across more than seven centuries, dozens of kings and one queen, at least four countries, literally gets cut down for size, all while harboring a supposed curse. This episode is based on research by William Dalrymple, Iraj Amani, and others mentioned on our website, scrollsandleaves.com. The stories here are nonfiction, but lightly embellished for color. In 2019, jewels that once belonged to Indian Maharajas were sold at Christie's Auction House in New York. Where shall we start? Four million dollars? Eight thousand online, all the way from China. The beautiful mirror of paradise, Golconda diamond, for five million, five hundred thousand dollars. The beautiful antique diamond Riviera necklace from Hyderabad, one million, nine hundred thousand, two million. The ceremonial sword of the Nizam of Hyderabad, at one point six million dollars. The enameled and gem set hooker set at six hundred and twenty thousand dollars. The spectacular.
spectacular Belle Epoque diamond Devon de Corsage by Cartier. 8,500,000, 8,800,000, Sold for 9.1 million. Thank you, sir. Okay, get this. The auction netted $109 million. Jeez, $109 million bucks? Yeah, incredible, isn't it? And these aren't just objects that are being sold, you know? They're also vessels of history, South Asian history. Here's Friederike Vogt, principal curator of Middle East and South Asia at the National Museum of Scotland. These jewels, if these were pearls or emeralds and rubies set in heavy necklaces, armlets, bangles. I mean, these are expressions of what people thought, and this is what often gets forgotten when these jewellery pieces are sold at auctions. So I want to know the stories that make these objects happen. And I want to know what the people do with it, what people think, not what they possessed. A great example of how jewels can be vessels of history is the Kohinoor. It's in the Tower of London, in the Queen Mother's Crown. It's 105 carats, the 90th largest diamond in the world. But in terms of mystique and notoriety, no other jewel surpasses it. It's even said to harbor a deadly curse. In this episode, we'll go through the Kohinoor's early years and tell you about a Persian king who aspired to conquer all of Asia, the diamond strapped to his arm. Hearing the story should give you a sense of the depth of history of other jewels on the global auction markets. And in the next episode, we'll let you decide if the Kohinoor has a powerful and ancient curse, that the diamond will bring bad luck to the men who wear it. Chapter 1. A Blemish Diamond is Bad Luck. Centuries ago, maybe around the 1300s, maybe in a deep, dark mine somewhere in South India, where almost all diamonds in the ancient world come from, a worker probably finds the Kohinoor in the rough. It's big, much, much more than 20 carats, which means it must go to the king's treasury. But this stone is impure. Yellow flecks run through its center like a scar. A marred diamond is inauspicious, according to Hindu custom. The king is probably happy to give the gem away to the newly arrived Muslim rulers in the north, the Mughals. Wait, why so many probabilities and maybes? Well, these are all educated guesses by historians. It's not written down anywhere. The Mughals are descendants of Timur. Some of you may know him as Tamerlane, one of the greatest military leaders of all time. The Mughals have ties to the Ottoman Empire based in Istanbul and to the Safavid rulers of Persia. All this to say, they have royal blood. And boy, do they love their jewels. Here's Ernest Tucker. He's a historian of the Middle East at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. The jewels of the Mughals had an enormous reputation. The stones were regarded as the tangible evidence of the perfection of nature that was also embodied by these great rulers. They were the the pinnacle of achievement and royalty and prosperity and stability embodied and and symbolized by these jewels. Anyone who wanted to style themselves a great ruler would want one of these. (laughs) Absolutely. And a king is being born who will desperately need to prove himself a great ruler. His life will entangle tragically with the Kohinoor. Chapter 2. An Upstart Shepherd's Boy with Royal Ambitions It's the autumn of 1688. We're in northwest Persia, modern-day Iran, near Khorasan, the land of the sun. Remember this place. It's about to get infamous. We're with a bunch of nomadic shepherds, and a woman is giving birth to the future king of Persia, Nader Shah. Nader grows up to be a brave and brutal young man. These are life-saving traits in these dangerous times. I mean, it was a brutal era, of course, the 18th century. It was a tough time, and he was from a society in which there was constant fighting. 
You know, there's a very famous game in Central Asia called Buz Kashi. It means in Persian goat dragging. It's the national sport of Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. It's, it's where teams of 100 horsemen drag a, a goat carcass back and forth across a giant playing field. This is the kind of military activity that went on all the time with these people. In the 1720s, Persia is in chaos. Invading Afghan hordes have deposed the Safavid king, and his son, the crown prince, is wandering around looking for military alliances to take back the throne. In Khorasan, he hears of Nader and hires him as his chief military commander. Quite a meteoric rise for a nomadic tribesman. Here's Ali Ansari, a historian of Iran at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. There's a story that he would, while sitting on his horse, viewing the battlefield, if he felt that any of his subsidiary commanders wasn't doing well enough, he simply went and with his axe sort of cut them down and then put his second in command in command. Try closing your eyes and seeing Nader. He's six foot tall, strong, tanned. His face is weathered, his beard is black, eyes are piercing and hooded by thick eyebrows, a mouth with a lower jaw jutting out. His voice is loud and rough. Within years, Nader throws the Afghans out of Persia. Let's join him six years later. It's 1736, on the fertile plains of Mogan, in the northwest of Iran where he's gathered a Koraltai, a grand meeting in the tradition of Tamerlane and the infamous Mongol ruler Genghis Khan. This story is based on research by Iraj Amani, the last French ambassador to the Shah of Iran. The clerics have gathered to decide who will ascend the throne of Persia. Should it be someone from the Safavid dynasty once again? Or should it be their feared military commander, Nadir Shah? Nader is behaving like he doesn't care for the throne. He simply wants to go back home to Khorasan, take a rest. The Sheikh ul Islam, who's the most important cleric or mullah in Persia, suggests that it should be someone from the Safavid line. Nader Shah orders his men to bring the Sheikh into the main tent. All the political and religious leaders are gathered there. And in front of them all, he strangles the mullah to death. Months later, he's crowned the Shah of Persia. But Nader isn't happy with just Persia. He wants to be the Shahin Shah, the king of all kings in the Muslim lands. Afghanistan, the Ottoman Empire, Hindustan, he sends emissaries to the Ottomans in Istanbul and the Mughals in Delhi, suggesting he be their Shah and Shah. And ha ha, they don't take him very seriously, Ernest says. We met him before. So Nader sharpens his sword and picks off Afghanistan in 1738. In northern Afghanistan, he captures Kandahar and recruits many Afghani men into his army, including an enterprising teenager, name of Ahmed Khan Abdili, this is the same Ahmed you met at the start of the episode. Do you remember? Emperor Ahmed with the jewel-studded fake nose? With the fakir Purnapuri? That meeting actually takes place in the future. We'll catch up with him again soon. As Nader builds a ferocious army, his spies bring him good news. Delhi is weak. Hindustan is ruled by the Mughal Emperor Muhammad Shah. He's a scatterbrain and he has priceless treasures in the Red Fort. His throne, the peacock throne, is made of gold and covered in rubies, emeralds, garnets, pearls. There's a large clear diamond called the Kohi Noor and its sister diamond that's pink, the Daryai Noor and the priceless Timur ruby. There are four columns holding up the canopy and each column is shaped into cypress trees and covered in green enamel and emeralds. On the top are two jeweled peacocks. The steps leading to the throne are covered in jewels of fine water. Now the ponders, what if he goes to Delhi, like the great Tamerlane did more than 300 years ago? If only he could get the jewels, maybe even the Kohinoor, that would show who's king of kings. Why is this person on the throne? Because 
the idea would be implicitly because God put him or her there. And, and the wealth conveys that. How why else do they have the wealth that's, ah, that's been given to them somehow? They march out, this army of 150,000 fierce Persians and Afghans. They conquer Kabul. They descend the treacherous Khyber Pass, go past Lahore in the north, the plains of Punjab. It was seen as, in terms of a military feat, in terms of a logistical feat, quite an achievement to do that. And they arrive at Karnal, 120 kilometers outside Delhi. Here are the Mughals. A million warriors and their attendants are amassed into a mighty force that covers 77 square kilometers. If only these men are well trained, this army could overrun the world. But they aren't. They're not even paid properly. Like a sloth, the Mughal army moves just eight kilometers a day. They're no match for Nader's men, who are so highly trained and armed with armor-penetrating, horse-mounted swivel guns. The Mughals lead an undisciplined charge. They hit a wall of fire. And so begins the last years of the Mughals. In March 1739, Nader rides into Delhi on a gray horse. He stays in the Mughal emperor's personal apartments and boots him into the women's quarters. The next morning, a piece of fake news travels rapidly across Delhi, with catastrophic results. Have you heard? The invader Nadir Shah has been killed. Let's get rid of these invading Persians. In ours, 900 Persian troops are killed by the residents of Delhi. Nadir Shah is angry. The next morning, he straps on his full armor and climbs his horse. He rides to the Golden Mosque of Roshan Uddala in Chandani Chowk, climbs to the terrace, looks down at the city and orders a slaughter. It begins with military precision at 9 a.m. Persian soldiers move from house to house, killing, stealing rich clothes, jewels, dishes of gold and silver, carry away wives and daughters as slaves. Houses are set on fire, bodies pile up on streets, whole mohallas are gutted. It feels like it's raining blood because the drains are streaming with it. The Mughal officials go to Nadar on their knees and beg him to spare Delhi. Nadar relents after six hours. He sheets his sword. The slaughter ends. But can you see the corpses on the street? Can you smell the rotting flesh? Nader Shah is not interested in ruling Hindustan. His heart is back in the wilds of Khorasan. All he wants is 348 years of accumulated treasures from the Mughal court. He tells Emperor Muhammad Shah, You can still be Shah, the ruler of the Mughals. You can still be Muhammad Shah. I am now Nader Afshar Shahan Shah. And the key thing was, he said, we also need to transfer the Mughal treasury to my treasury that I'm building in my fortress on a mountain plateau back in Khorasan. I think in in modern currency, it was worth something like $70 billion. Such was the loot that it, um, I mean, even at the time, people were sort of slightly aghast at it. In the Red Fort, Nader sees the diamond for the first time, the Kohinoor embedded in the peacock throne. It's next to its sister, the pink darya i and the Timor ruby. Legend says the gems call out to him. It said that when Nader saw this, he said, ah, in Kohenure, Kohenur, this is a mountain of light. And I think that the idea was that the gem was so rare and so unique that it encapsulated somehow a divine sense of uniqueness and rarity that he wanted to be associated with. It's very interesting, the name Nader, means rare and unique. So a rare and unique jewel for a rare and unique person. Nader leaves Delhi after two months, having packed an immense treasure chest from Hindustan. Several hundred large diamonds, including of course the Kohinoor, horse harnesses studded with jewels, weapons, the fabulous peacock throne, and other thrones. Depending on which historical account you believe, a massive caravan of 700 elephants, 12,000 horses, 
4,000 camels and slaves, all carrying jewels. 100 eunuchs, 130 scribes, 300 masons, 200 blacksmiths, 100 stonecutters, 200 carpenters, musicians, dancers, wind their way out of Hindustan. Some of the jewels on the global auction markets today, and some in the crown jewel and private collections around the world are from this ancient loot. Oh, like what? Well, the Iranian crown jewel collection is full of these stones, including the darya e nur then the great Mughal diamond in the Russian crown jewels, it's called the Orlov now. The Shah diamond is also in Russia, the great table diamond, the Golconda de Or in Australia, the Timur ruby. Chapter 3. Nadir Shah goes mad. After his return from India, he was a changed man. Because in terms of power corrupting, his success in India got the better of him. And he basically, he then becomes more and more carried away with himself really as this sort of charismatic uh, world conquering hero. Not only does he get more and more ambitious, I mean, one could call it megalomania, to be honest, about further conquests with the Ottomans and others. But where people were saying that they were happy to follow him to India, for instance, and to follow him and doing all these sort of grand things, the country needed a break and it needed time to sort of recoup, redress itself. And he started also to get paranoid. India had, had effectively uh, or effectively driven him mad. Could this be the curse of the Kohinoor? You know, that it brings bad luck? Maybe, if there is such a thing as a curse. Nader wears the diamond strapped to his arm like a talisman. And it's certainly true that after he gets the diamond, Nader becomes paranoid. So, getting back to Persia, the people are tired of war, and they approach Nader's eldest son, Reza Kohli, and complain. And of course, Nader Shah viewed this very unfavorably. He would sort of see the son being a bit presumptuous, almost having a court of his own. And the great tragedy of it is, is that he saw his son as a threat. So, two years after India, Nader is riding through some woods near Tehran. When someone shoots at him, the lead bullet narrowly misses him and hits his horse instead. And Nader thinks his son Reza ordered the hit. And as a consequence, had his son blinded. His men bring him his son's eyeballs on a platter. And seeing it... Of course, he, he regretted it. He cries, shakes with grief, screams. I mean, he regretted it very much because his son was a very capable individual. But the great tragedy of, of Nader Shah is he wanted to create a dynasty. But actually, in the pursuit of his dynasty, he was so paranoid, he basically demolished the chances of that happening by blinding his firstborn son, who was probably the most able of his offspring. So, you know, all that leads to the sort of a paranoid downward spiral, which the very assets that made him such a powerful leader, if brutal, uh, basically worked against him through the 1740s. Nader becomes so ruthless that he orders his troops to kill all these people, take the skulls and create these towers of skulls. Outside his fort is a warning, do not mess with me. But we need to contextualize his brutality. Nader was no more or less brutal than other rulers of those times, whether in Asia or in Europe. He's in quite good company, really. Even some of the Safavid kings before him were not exactly pussycats in this regard. And certainly you know, nobody could be considered to be a champion of human rights in this period. So he's essentially going off his rocker, becoming incredibly paranoid. His senior officers never know when he's going to suspect them of something or the other, and, you know, add to that pile of skulls. So one night in 1747, as another sleeping in his tent, his bodyguards and senior officers creep in and stab and behead him. It's a pretty ignominious end, I have to say, for someone whose military career was so dramatic. But eventually, you know, people decided that there was no future with him. And in 1747, he's murdered in his tent by his bodyguards. But it's also a classic moral tale in that sense, that your paranoia begets paranoia. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? All told, Nader's ruled for just 11 years, 1736 to 1747. This is the last time the Persians will ever rule a vast empire. Ali says that if only Nader could have kept his paranoia in check, maybe the course of history would have been very different. I think for those of us looking at the history of the non-European world, we're always sort of thinking, when was the moment that Europe became very dominant? And 
the gunpowder empires, be they the, the Persians, the Ottomans and the Mughals, when did they succumb to that superior European technology, military technique? And were there opportunities, were there times when that, when that trajectory could have been different? And I think Nader Shah does represent that sort of possibility that things could have been different had obviously certain other things developed, had he not been assassinated by his guards, had he not blinded his son. Chapter 4, New Owners The Mughal jewels that Nadir took scatter across Central Asia. People kill for them, and of course, the power that they represent. The grandson of Nadir takes the other diamond from the peacock throne, the Darya Inur, the sister jewel to the Kohinoor. He is caught by an enemy of Nadir named Aga Muhammad Khan and is brutally tortured. Aga Muhammad demands the Kohinoor, which the grandson doesn't have. So Muhammad ties him to a chair, shaves his head, builds a mold, and then pours molten lead into it. So where's the Kohinoor? Remember that young man Nadir recruited back in Kandahar, Ahmed Khan? King Ahmed with the fake nose? After Nadir's murder, people are plundering the Mughal treasures, and Ahmed happens by the fallen king's tent and takes the Kohinoor and some other jewels. He rides back to Kandahar, and there in a tribal council, he's crowned Emperor of Afghanistan. His name becomes Ahmed Shah Durrani. He's just 24 years old, and this is the founding moment of the nation that we know today as Afghanistan. The king's first task is to replenish his coffers. Like his mentor, he looks down the Khyber Pass. What else does Hindustan have to offer? And we'll leave you back at the start of the episode, with King Ahmed a few years after his plunder of India, at his military camp near Ghazni with Purnapuri, to learn what happens next to the Kohinoor and to its various owners, and whose and what histories persist. Tune in next time. You were listening to episode two, Jewels of the Maharajas. Next time on Scrolls and Leaves, the diamond will find its way back to India in The Curse of the Kohinoor. Our sound designer is Nikhil Nagaraj. The storyteller is Sumit Kumar. This episode was produced by Gayathri, Mary Rose, with assistance from Iman Iftikhar, Sasha Samina, and Alexa Stanga. You were listening to Scrolls and Leaves in collaboration with the archives at the National Center for Biological Sciences. Our thanks to Ernest Tucker, Ali Ansari, and Frederike Vogt. Thanks to our episode supporter, the Yale Mellon Sawyer Seminar, the Order of Multitudes, Atlas Encyclopedia and Museum, and Anjana Badrinarainen of NCBS. For more information and past episodes, visit scrollsandleaves.com, or you can follow us on Twitter at scrollsleaves, or on Instagram at Scrolls and Leaves, or like us on Facebook and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening.